blinded by belief. The scientist publishes a list of top 10 retractions each year. We will look at one of those listed for 2017 that involved a Nobel laureate. Number 8. Definitely embarrassing. That's how Nobel winner Jack Sostak of Harvard University described the retraction in December of his 2016 article in Nature Chemistry. The authors asked for the retraction after a researcher in Sostak's lab could not reproduce the findings, which the group attributes to honest error. Sostak wasn't the only noblest to lose a paper this year. In October, Science retracted a 2014 paper by Bruce Butler, winner of the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, also for failure to reproduce the results. From Retraction Watch. Tracking reactions as a window into the scientific process. Definitely embarrassing. Nobel laureate retracts non-reproducible paper in Nature Journal. A Nobel laureate has retracted a 2016 paper in Nature Chemistry that explored the origins of life on Earth, after discovering the main conclusions were not correct. Some researchers who study the origins of life on Earth have hypothesized that RNA evolved before DNA or proteins. If true, RNA would have needed a way to replicate without enzymes. The Nature Chemistry paper found that a certain type of peptide, which may have existed in our early history, made it possible for RNA to copy itself. Jack Sostak, a professor of chemistry and chemical biology at Harvard University in Cambridge. We're not talking about some yehu somewhere. This is big cheese. Who shared the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider for their pioneering, pioneering research on aging, we're going to click that link and go to it in just a minute, told us he was incredibly excited when he thought we had at least a partial solution to this problem. You never heard of this problem, which researchers have been working on for over 50 years. Well, uh, Jack Sostak won the Nobel Prize for what? Well, if you go to NobelPrize.org, you will find uh, the laureates in 2009 this little page. The Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 2009 was awarded jointly to those three people, and Sostak is the last named, for the discovery of how chromosomes are protected by telomeres and the enzyme telomerase. All the stuff you hear about telomeres and how long cells last and all that stuff. These are the people who discovered that. Okay. But in subsequent experiments, you remember he's working on the origin of life. Tivoli Olson, a member of Sostek's lab, could not reproduce the 2016 findings. When she reviewed the experiments from the Nature Chemistry paper, she found that the team had misinterpreted the initial data. Data was right, but the interpretation was incorrect. The peptide in question did not appear to provide an environment that fostered RNA replication. The errors were definitely embarrassing, Sostak told us. In retrospect, we were totally blinded by our belief. Which is, of course, where I got the title of this talk. We were not as careful or rigorous as we should have been, and as Tivoli was, in interpreting these experiments. So Stack added, the only saving grace is that we are the ones who discovered and corrected our own errors and figured out what was going on. Using we in a broad sense, it was Tavoli Olson, who was part of the lab, I guess, but not part of the paper. Given the issues, the authors requested that the Nature Chemistry paper, oligoarginine peptide slow strand annealing and assist non-enzymatic RNA replication, be retracted. This retraction marks the second in six months for Nature Chemistry after having none for eight years. 
The paper has been cited nine times in about a year, according to Clarivate An Analytics Web of Science. Most of them are presumably approvingly. Well, one of them may have been the retraction, um, but certainly eight times. That's impressive. All of a sudden, this thing that everybody accepted as part of RNA world lore just disappeared. Done by a reputable lab headed by an extra reputable researcher. A previous replication issue, it turns out that Sostak had to retract another paper once. Uh, 2008, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, after an outside researcher could not replicate the results. The retraction notice uh, credited Catherine Berry, then a doctoral student at the University of California, Berkeley, for bringing the issues to their attention. But once they got the issues brought to their attention, they immediately rechecked, and sure enough, it was not true, and they had to um, say, oopsie, uh, forget that, we uh, didn't do it right. Uh, retraction watches Victoria Stern and Barry were roommates freshman year of college. So there's a little inside there to retraction watch itself. Skipping on a few paragraphs uh, that refer to this, the other one, I think. The paper, Selection of Cyclic Peptide Aptamers to HCV IRES RNA Using mRNA Display has been cited seven times, including once by the retraction notice. So six times approvingly, apparently, or at least accepting the results. Science in theory is self-correcting. In practice, maybe, but maybe after a while. Um, that particular paper had to do with hepatitis C virus and peptides glomming onto it and uh, preventing it from, uh, from infecting people. And it would have been very nice to have been able to give people a short polypeptide ring and cure hepatitis C, but not so. The notice for uh, the paper we're talking about in Nature Chemistry provides a detailed account of what happened, and I'm going to skip over that because we're going to quote it in a little while. Um, moving forward, Olson, the researcher in Sosak's lab who discovered the issue with the 2016 paper in Nature Chemistry, told us, as a scientist, the job is to troubleshoot. You can't help, nor can you ignore where that takes you. I fulfilled my obligation to ensure that no one after me would waste their time on this. Arginine does not allow uh, RNA to replicate. Now, Sostak told us that he plans to continue working to unravel the problem of chemically replicating RNA. In the RNA world, the RNA doesn't replicate? That's a problem? I guess so. Although we are disappointed that this approach does not work, we are going back to the drawing board and looking into other ways of overcoming this roadblock. Roadblock. Difficulty in the RNA world. We're going to get into just what that difficulty is in a little bit. But think about the mentality that says, well, this didn't work. There must be some way, though, because somehow we got there and it wasn't intelligent design. And that's explicit in another, uh, in another uh, setting. The paper itself, oligoarginine peptides show strand annealing, slow strand annealing, and assist non-enzymatic RNA replication. Nature Chemistry 8. And you can get the first page at uh, nature.com articles. If you're a faculty at Loma Linda, you can get the entire thing. Um, you just have to uh, go after it the proper way. If you're uh, 
if you're Googling, you can also get the abstract, but the first page contains the abstract. Um, the abstract itself reads, the non-enzymatic replication of RNA is thought to have been a critical process required for the origin of life. Um, it either had to be uh, non-enzymatic or it had to be enzymatic, and how do you get enzymes first? One unsolved difficulty with non-enzymatic RNA replication is that template-directed copying of RNA results in a double-strand product. Well, duh. After strand separation, rapid strand re-annealing outcompetes slow non-enzymatic template copying, which renders multiple rounds of RNA replication impossible. In other words, you create RNA, you create double-stranded RNA, and now that sucker won't come apart in order to replicate it some more. So, I understand non-enzymatic copy. What is that? Well, that means that you copy it without the use of enzymes. Yeah. But how do you do that? Well, what you do is you put a bunch of, uh, um, actually, RNA uh, uh, let's say ATP, GTP, CTP, UTP uh, together won't do the job uh, well enough at least and so what they do is they attach the RNA to uh, inosine monophosphate so they make they don't just make ATP they make uh, the, uh, the adenosine part and then they join it with phosphate to inosine so when it breaks apart uh, you wind up with AMP at the end uh, that can be well you're quibbling <laughs> here we show that the oligoarginine peptides that means just a few arginine stuck together. Show the annealing complementary oligoribonucleotides. Slow the annealing of, in other words, it keeps them from re-wrapping up again by several thousand fold. However, short primers and activated monomers can still bind to template strands and template directed primer extension can still occur. The idea is that you get a little piece that matches and apparently it can stick to it even though the whole uh, thing won't re-anneal. Now remember, take this all with a grain of salt because they retracted the paper, so um, didn't really happen the way they're presenting it. All within a phase separated condensed state or coacervate, little tiny things that look kind of vaguely like bacteria, have a uh, little RNA in the middle of them. Furthermore, we show that within this phase, partial template copying occurs even in the presence of full-length complementary strands. Again, take that with a grain of salt, but that's, for the, that's what they were hoping for, that's what they claimed. This method to enable further rounds of replication suggests one mechanism by which short non-coded peptides could have enhanced earlier cellular fitness and potentially explains how longer coded peptides, that is proteins, came to prominence in modern biology. Uh, that last was a little stretch, but whatever. Their beginning is still true because what they're gonna do is outline the problem and the problem remains as intractable as ever. And now that their way of going around it um, didn't work, the, the, uh, the problem is becoming even more intractable because we know one way that will not work, that might have. RNA has been postulated to be the biopolymer from which the early life on Earth evolved. That's a quick statement of RNA world. Owing to the central role of RNA as a mediator of information transfer between DNA and proteins, and of the ability of RNA to act as both a propagator of genetic information and as a catalyst. So it can it contain information and it can catalyze and then it can be copied directly without having to go through some kind of code. 
Most notably, RNA is the catalyst responsible for the ribosomal synthesis of all coded proteins. Ribosomes are specifically made out of RNA. Which strongly suggests that RNA-based catalysis preceded the evolution of coded peptide synthesis. If you had to have a pathway, it makes more sense to have it RNA. That's why RNA world is as popular as it is. Furthermore, recent findings pointed to a potential prebiotic pathway for the synthesis of ribonucleotides and thus of RNA. Well, if you stretch it a little bit, yeah. If RNA was indeed the original biopolymer of cellular life, so let's forget about the problems with that. Let's just uh, let's assume that, that uh, we can get there from here. Then selective pressures for faster and more accurate RNA replication would probably have led to the evolution of an RNA polymerase ribozyme that could catalyze the replication of increasingly complex RNA genomes. However, prior to the evolution of the first RNA polymerase ribozyme, RNA must have replicated non-enzymatically. Until you've got some kind of an enzyme, RNA or otherwise, you, you don't have enzymes. This conclusion has motivated a long history of efforts to copy RNA templates non-enzymatically, and although the efficient copying of arbitrary template sequences has not yet been demonstrated, RNA world has not gotten there yet. It's a hope, and maybe we can get there. Recent advances suggest that such template copying may well be possible. Well, yeah. <laughs> You're so skeptical. Uh, given the potential for non-enzymatic template copying to generate seminal RNA strands, one must then ask what additional steps are required to enable repeated cycles of RNA replication. The non-enzymatic copying of a template strand results in the formation of an RNA duplex which must then denature to provide templates for the next round of replication. Previously, we showed that the thermal separation of strands of an RNA duplex is facilitated by the incorporation of a fraction of two prime, five prime linkages in the RNA backbone. They don't fit together as well. Well, they probably don't copy as well either, but we'll forget that little detail. Um, by the way, when you try to create RNA out of some of these precursors, most of the time, uh, not all the time, but most of the time, you get almost exclusively two prime, five prime linkages. So they're saying, yeah, good, but at the same time, you're not making really RNA. These linkages form as a consequence of non-enzymatic template copying and significantly lower the melting temperature of the resulting duplex. It doesn't stick together as well. Which is, of course, why the body uses DNA in the three prime, five prime position. However, subsequent rounds of non-enzymatic RNA replication are inhibited by the rapid reannealing of the separated strands after heating and cooling which present, prevents the weakly binding RNA primers and activated monomers required for poly polymerization from associating with the template. Once you've got it together in a double-stranded, it doesn't copy. <coughs> for subsequent rounds of replication to be possible, reannealing of the separated single strands must occur on a time scale that is comparable to or slower than the rate of strand copying. So we have to slow this down enough to where you have a chance to get something else started on that uh, RNA strand. In principle, this kinetic control could be accomplished by operating in a highly dilute regime, um, less than one nanomolar of RNA. However, one nanomolar RNA corresponds to only a few strands per pro protocell, three to four micron, micrometers in diameter. Protocells that contain only a few strands of RNA would not have contained a sufficient concentration of an RNA with a catalytic activity to confer a benefit to the protocell. It's too dilute. 
So you need more RNA in there, just like our cells are packed with other things besides just water. We therefore sought to identify conditions under which RNA strand reannealing at more relevant micromolar concentrations is significantly slowed, but with a minimal effect on the template copying chemistry. So they're trying to give template copying an advantage over uh, this reannealing, which naturally happens. Considerable evidence supports the possibility that peptides and RNA could have been present together. Well, yeah, I guess possibility. Probability. Mm. Watch these people grasp for the least, the, the least chance they have. It's like, you know, the guy who's falling down the cliff and is grabbing at straws. Or the or the drunk man who's d drowning is grabbing at straws. Um, anything. Now this is interesting. They could have been present together on the primitive earth. Atmospheric discharge experiments. Anybody want to guess what number 18 is? Miller-Urey. 1953, totally discredited in, in terms of what the normal atmosphere on the Earth is now, or was at the, the point in time when it's usually used, but it's still in there. Transport from meteorites and cosmic dust, maybe they came in with meteorites. Meteorites are a rich source of amino acid. Well, you know, maybe a few uh, thousand molecules per meteorite. You hit enough meteorites, maybe you'll get a few. Um, and more recent scenarios for prebiotic amino acid synthesis. That means something else other than Miller-Urey all point towards the existence of amino acids on the Earth's surface shortly after its formation. Don't ask it what concentration. That's skepticism, and you, you know about that. Um, although early studies indicates, indicated that the basic amino acids, arginine and lysine, would have been among the least abundant, Usually it produces something else. Recent studies in it illustrate a prebiotically plausible arginine synthesis from simple precursors in a cyanide-rich reducing environment in the presence of hydrogen sulfide. That sounds like a good way to get life started. Lots of hydrogen cyanide, lots of sulfide, hydrogen sulfide. It raises some interesting questions about why cytochrome uh, P450 and cytochrome C evolved, um, given the uh, possibility of poisoning, but whatever. Given the potential existence of arginine-rich peptides, potential existence, maybe one or two in the entire world, uh, coupled with the ability of these peptides to bind RNA, we sought to explore the nature and consequences of such RNA peptide interactions on non-enzymatic replication. In the course of these investigations, we discovered that short arginine-rich peptides, and they're talking rich, um, can prevent the annealing of complementary RNA strands in a concentration and length dependent manner. That means the higher the concentration, the more inhibition there is, and the longer the length, the more inhibition there is. In the present work, and again, take this with a grain of salt because this has been retracted now. We simulate a post-replication round of non-enzymatic RNA polymerization by thermally denaturing an RNA complex, that means heating it up until it unwinds, and show that template-directed primer extension proceeds only in the presence of an oligoarginine peptide. 
We also show that the non-enzymatic primary extension reaction occurs within a phase-separated condensed state, that is a coacervate, formed by the electrostatic binding of oppositely charged RNA and oligoarginine polyelectrolytes. They attract each other. Taken together, these results show that cationic peptides could have enhanced the fitness of an emerging protocell by assisting in multiple rounds of replication. Except, as we've noted, not. Results, <coughs> binding of RNA to oligoarginine peptides. That probably happens. The driving force, I'm skipping down to the end of the first paragraph, the driving force of this complexation is probably electrostatic. That is, arginine is charged uh, positively, the uh, RNA is charged negatively, well, they attract. As seen, with, as seen previously for the association of polylysine with DNA. To examine the effect of peptide and RNA length on the concentration dependence of the interaction, we turn to fluorescence and uh, anisotropy titrations. Don't worry too much about that stuff. Uh, we're going to skip over that part because it only makes sense. You have polyarginine and it's going to stick to RNA. Oligoarginine peptides interfere with RNA annealing. And again, that's mostly pretty obvious. If you've got a, a, one thing stuck to a pro, a, a, an RNA molecule, it's likely to interfere with the, uh, with the uh, uh, RNA sticking to itself. Oligoarginine-assisted non-enzymatic RNA replication and this is the part that they had to retract, uh, the specific part. The observation that R10NH2, let me unpack that for you, that means 10 arginines in a row, nothing else, all stuck together by the standard uh, uh, peptide bond, none through the, uh, through the guanine residue, greatly slows the annealing of two RNA 15 mers with little effect on the rate of annealing a 7 mer to a 15 mer, led us to hypothesize that in the presence of R, uh, R10 and H, uh, I don't know why they left out the two, but they didn't everywhere else, so I think that's a misprint, a short primer would still be able to anneal to a longer template even when the complementary strand to the template is present and so allow primary extension to occur. So you have 15s together, they won't budge. You put arginine in there, they won't stick to each other, but apparently there's enough left over for a seven to stick to a 15, and then you can create the rest of the 15 out of it. That doesn't sound like much of a uh, replication, but you know, you're grasping at straws, you'll take what you can get. We found that the rate of primer extension decreased by only about 30%. So uh, yes, it, even RNA stuck to uh, uh, arginine, uh, multiple arginines, did not um, allow the primer to get on as well, but it only dropped it by about a third. So it decreased by 30% in the presence of one micromolar of the, the 10 arginine peptide. In contrast to the increasing, uh, increase of more than three orders of magnitude in the annealing uh, half time of two RNA 15 mers in the presence of 100 micromolar uh, R10 NH2. Now wait a minute. They just switched something on you. I don't know if you w saw that. You put 100 micromolar and it decreases the two RNA 15 mers by three orders of magnitude. You take one micromolar and it only decreases 30%. Why aren't we seeing a head-to-head -head comparison there? Like 100 micromolar for both. Or like uh, one micromolar for both. 
presumably doesn't show what you're expecting, I guess. To our satisfaction, I'm not sure I'd be satisfied with that routine, a promising result was obtained when the complementary strand to a template pre-incubated with R10NH was added to a, a preformed primer template complex also pre-incubated with peptide. You put the peptide on first and maybe you can get one but not the other, but you have to use 100 times the concentration in order to make it work. Aren't they all in the same bag? We then turned our attention to simulating a post-replication round of non-enzymatic template-directed primary extension. So now they're going to add stuff and try to make that uh, peptide longer. By starting with an RNA duplex, that is a template strand already bound to its complement, we added the other components of the non-enzymatic primer extension reaction, that is you have to have the primer, which is five peptides specifically arranged together, right? Okay, magnesium and two methyl inosine monophosphate guanine. Now how you get that by random methods, I don't know, but whatever. And briefly heated the sample to 95 degrees centigrade. You almost boiled the thing. To melt the duplex, followed immediately by cooling on ice. That sounds like something that happens all the time. Uh, rapid cooling is necessary, most probably to allow peptide RNA binding to occur before the annealing of complementary RNA strands, which later in the article it'll tell you take less than one second to happen. That's what they mean by immediately. We propose that the thermally separated template and complement each tightly bind to the peptide, which prevents them from re-annealing. However, the shorter primer binds more weakly to the peptide and is still able to hybridize to the template. Thus, so the peptide, uh, peptide not only gets this 15 mer, it gets the 7 mer as well but just not as tightly, and so uh, somehow they can join, thus allowing non-enzymatic primer extension to proceed under conditions that approximate, maybe, a post-replication round of RNA polymerization. Primary extension without the RNA peptide condensed phase, well, yeah, you can do that. Um, and then I'm going to move on to discussion like I say, they've retracted the most important part of it. So um, one of the s seldom addressed problems with the RNA world hypothesis, again, how many of you have heard of this before today? It's seldom addressed. It's seldom mentioned, let alone addressed. Is that for multiple generations of non-enzymatic RNA replication to occur, the new stringle stranded templates generated by melting the duplex product of template copying must reanneal on a time scale comparable to or slower than the time scale of template copying. Because if it comes back together again, now you can't get started on your new uh, replication. You get one replication and then you die. Pretty much literally. At least the, uh, the RNA dies. In practice, this is a formidable challenge because the reannealing of complementary RNA strains at reasonable concentrations, about one micromolar, is extremely fast. Half time is one second. Whereas RNA copying chemistry, at least in the current state of the art, what about in the current state of nature or the past state of nature is quite slow, occurring over hours to days. It must be more like millennia in the early Earth. We have demonstrated here that the binding of oligoarginine peptides to complementary strands of RNA selectively slow down, slows down strand annealing by up to several thousand fold, presumably without getting in the way of the uh, primer binding. Although we have shown that oligoarginine binding to RNA slows complement template annealing, it keeps them from coming back together, the mechanism by which this occurs remains to be elucidated. So of course, 
if you've got a lab, you're going to say, well, let's see if we can figure out the mechanism. Uh, and that's probably what happened was Tivoli Olson was going to extend this and found out she couldn't reproduce the original experiments. Thus, the prebiotic accessibility of a steep temperature gradient is critical for successful replication in the system we studied. What does that mean? What it means is that you've got to cool this stuff down from near boiling to near freezing rapidly. Thermal convection and, uh, and uh, thermophoresis within the porous rocks of hydrothermal vents, that's one possibility, and hydrothermal circulation generated by hydrothermal vents in ponds or lakes, that's another possibility, are two prebiotically plausible environments. Depends on how desperate you are for plausible. Like I say, think of the drunk man in the straws that would allow biomolecules to access both very hot and very cold aqueous environments on a time scale fast enough to promote successful non-enzymatic replication. Um, and I'm going to skip over the next three paragraphs. Uh, this, by the way, is taken from scientific, uh, Science, uh, Science Mag uh, News, which was talking about uh, uh, RNA world in a slightly different context, but um, what I'm going to say is that if these people are correct about RNA annealing, and it looks like they probably are, this is a bad picture. What we need is snow on the mountains. <clears throat> To better understand the origin of life, we aim to design and construct a model protocell system. For example, a fatty acid vesicle that contains templates, primers, activated mononucleotides, peptides, and catalytic metal ions, all of those stuff together, um, in which multiple rounds of non-enzymatic primer extension reactions can be induced by thermal cycling. So you don't just do it once. You, you have to do it once for every time you reproduce this thing. Um, so you have to get hot and then cold and then hot and then cold. And can be iterated and ad infinitum. As long as you have some kind of cycling that you can make it go through. Multiple rounds of replication would bring us one step closer to emulating the first primitive cells that were able to grow, divide, and evolve under early Earth conditions. And I'm going to skip the last uh, section, which is on methods, because as we know now, they don't believe their own methods anymore. The retraction is interesting to look at. This is, uh, was quoted earlier by Retraction Watch. And it's in Nature Chemistry, all official and everything. Um, I think I've mistake, uh, misstated that. I think this is 2017 instead of 2016. Uh, you can find it uh, on the internet. We, the authors, are retracting this article because our efforts to repeat and follow up on the results have been unsuccessful. Sure enough, that's what happened. They went to follow up on it and they couldn't repeat the originals. Specifically, we have been unable to reproduce observations suggesting that arginine-rich peptides allow the non-enzymatic copying of an RNA template in the presence of its complementary strand. The key point. We originally dismissed variability in these experiments, so they had some that worked and some that didn't work, as resulting from variability in the snap cooling of samples following thermal denaturation. Or denaturation. So they thought it was, you know, you cool it and it just didn't, uh, sometimes it cooled fast enough and sometimes it didn't. But apparently there was more to it than that. However, we now understand that the data reported in, published, in the published articles are the result of false positives that arose from an incorrectly designed experiment in which random errors, including transfer and concentration errors, affected the ratio of the concentrations of the RNA template and its complementary strand. Some didn't have the complementary strand, and so of course it didn't anneal. This resulted in false positives that were misinterpreted as template copying 
in the presence of a complementary strand, where in reality these reactions did not contain enough complementary strands to completely inhibit the reaction. You still fill it up and then it stops. Subsequent experiments suggested that arginine-rich peptides may not slow the reannealing of complementary strands. Doesn't even do that, maybe. And that what we had previously interpreted as a decrease in annealing rate was actually an artifact due to slow coalescence or strand exchange between droplets of RNA, peptide coacervate, as well as droplet coalescence and settling that led to decreased fluorescence intensity. Similarly, the changing circular dichroism spectra shown in fig figure 2C, which were originally interpreted to be the results of a change in the global helical structure of RNA upon peptide binding, may also be an artifact due to, for example, loss of signal or light scattering. Although the binding of arginine-rich peptides to RNA does form condensed phase droplets, and although most of the RNA does reside within the condensed phase, Follow-up experiments to confirm that non-enzymatic RNA polymerization occurs within these coacervate droplets has been, have been inconclusive. The experiments showing that vesicles are stable in the presence of arginine-rich peptides and the failure of acidic peptides to condense RNA have been reproduced. So if you have acidic like glutamic acid or aspartic acid or something like that, then it doesn't work. Yes, that's true. And uh, the ves uh, you apparently can form vesicles. However, since the main conclusions of our paper are incorrect, all of the authors are now retracting the article. The authors would like to thank Dr. Tivoli Olson for her extensive effort to unravel the errors in our article, and we apologize to the scientific community for any confusion arising from our publication. That is what an apology looks like in the literature. Now, as you can imagine, various intelligent design and creationist sources have picked up on this, and I'm just going to give two of them. Um, this one is uh, Evolution News and Views. It's a retraction show, Scientists Blinded by Belief, by Ann Gager. And uh, I'm going to skip down to the last two paragraphs. The rest of them go over material that we've already been over. Sostak and Olson are to be commended for their integrity. They did what should be done. But here's the key point. Scientists are human, and they desire certain outcomes that fit with strongly held beliefs. Sostak has been looking for a long time for a way to make RNA replicate. So when he found something promising, as he said, we were totally blinded by our belief. It is absolutely necessary that we be our own severest critics and check and double check our interpretations of data. This applies to all points of view on the origin spectrum. Everything is subject to evaluation, everything. Bias and preconception and strongly held beliefs are to be found on all sides. It is not those prejudiced creationists versus scientists who have no ax to grind and are being straightforward with the data. That is a very poor presentation of how, it's, um, how things are. If we wish to arrive at the truth, we need to be willing to show as much integrity as Dr. Sostak did. And then the other one that I'll give is by Sean Pittman, whom some of you know, Nobel Prize winner blinded by belief retracts a 2016 paper on RNA self-replication. And um, again, it's on the internet. And I'm going to skip over the first five paragraphs for the same reason. I mean, maybe it's six, depending on how you count it. Sostak's comment that his team was blinded by our beliefs is significant. There's more to this story than just what you've seen so far. Beyond the fact that it highlights that scientists are human, just like everyone else, Sostak had previously, in a 2010 letter to Daryl Falk, condemned, quote, belief systems based on faith, end quote, as, quote, inherently dangerous, as they leave the believer to, uh, susceptible to manipulation when skepticism and inquiry are discouraged, end quote. 
Yet evidently he didn't realize his own susceptibility to this problem, a problem from which even scientists are not immune. This particular letter that he referenced was in response to Falk's review of Stephen Meyer's 2009 book, Signature in the Cell, particularly regarding the following passage. In chapter 14, this is quoting Falk's review, as Stephen Meyer brings his discussion about the feasibility of RNA's role as the early storehouse for cellular information to a conclusion, he recalls a 20-year-old conversation with a philosophy professor about origins of life research. The field is becoming increasingly populated by cranks. Everyone knows everybody else's theory doesn't work, but no one is willing to admit that, admit it about his own. Following this statement, Meyer fast forwards into the present and writes of his own assessment of the field 20 years later. I found no reason to amend these assessments. Well, that's kind of insulting a little bit, right? So it seems as though Sostak didn't take very kindly to being called a crank. At the time of the publication of Meyer's book, strong criticism of it suggested that Sostak and others were fast closing in on a solution to the origin of life prog uh, problem with the principle of RNA uh, self-replication touted by Sostak in, for example, a 2009 Scientific American article. Following the publication of Meyer's book, Sostak himself criticized, quote, anti-evolution ID for, quote, science denial, end quote. He observed, quote, this kind of denial is a dangerous thing. Denial of reality is extremely bad for the future of our country and our world. Oh, denial of reality? Or maybe denial of my pet theory? Of course, it, now, it seems now as though Meyer is back on top. The arguments in favor of life spontaneously creating itself are just as cranky and wishful and full of blind hope and faith as they ever were. Yet for those whose faith in naturalism is strong, the lack of evidence matters not. As Sostak pointed out, although we are disappointed that the, that approach does not work, we are going back to the drawing board and looking into other ways of overcoming this roadblock. Those keys have just got to be here somewhere. And I think I know where they are. At what point does one simply accept the obvious weight of evidence and simply admit that an extremely intelligent and powerful designer clearly had a hand in the production of life and its diversity on this planet? And I think that's a really important question. And in fact, if you read Robert Shapiro, you'll find that there are people who say, it doesn't matter what the evidence says. I'm looking for that. I don't want to think about an intelligent designer. Now, my takes, uh, Sostak is a sharp guy. He, along with colleagues, discovered telom uh, telomeres and telomerase. Um, he's at Harvard for a reason. He got his Nobel Prize for a reason. He can be brutally honest with himself, as is witnessed by two retractions of papers produced by his lab, without having to be drawn kicking and screaming through it. And yet, he can be totally blinded by belief. It can happen to anybody. In fact, it happened to Einstein. You may remember he fought with the Im implications of quantum mechanics his whole life. Sostak still has that belief that blinded him to this particular pro uh, problem. He is sure that there, must, there just must be some pathway to life, and it almost certainly involves RNA, and so the obstacles in the way must yield somehow to proper investigation. There's got to be an answer there somewhere, and whatever it is, it's not intelligent design. Now, we creationists need to be careful about allowing this kind of confirmation bias to ruin our science as well. But I think we need to be aware that there is tremendous confirmation bias supporting the current scientific consensus. Tremendous. They know where they've got to go. They know there must be a pathway. They're going to find it. 
And most importantly, we need not always adjust our theology to conform to that scientific consensus. It's biased. Now, I will finish with two quotes that seem, at least to me, to be appropriate. Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The emphasis here is the world and science is part of the world, especially the current scientific consensus is part of the part of the world that we need not to be conformed to. Uh, I think we have to be careful. And, and secondly, uh, Paul's last advice to Timothy, first Tim, or n near the last advice, uh, Timothy, First Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Take some of this stuff with a grain of salt. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, Jack. Af and after him. I've been very interested in this topic for some time. <clears throat> About a decade and a half ago, I was uh, coordinating a senior capstone seminar at Andrews for our biology majors. And uh, the RNA world and the RNA solution was a lot bigger then than it seems to be now. Uh, I had the unusual opportunity to attend a meeting really t uh, celebrating Thomas Such's discovery of RNA catalysis. And this uh, meeting was attended by Watson, Crick, Sostak, Such, of course, and several others. And they were... You're talking about the big guns. Yes. They are all celebrating with a huge amount of relief that they could finally come up with something that was more probable than the whole mechanism for protein synthesis that's there. It, the, the, sudden, the sudden acceptance of this as seemed to me dogma was amazing. As a matter of fact, Thomas Setch got the Nobel Prize while he was a postdoc within several years of his PhD thesis, which was focused on catalytic RNA. And, uh, it's been so interesting to kind of listen. I'm not into that literature anymore, but uh, they at least haven't gone back to insisting that the whole DNA, the R DNA RNA protein process had to be fully implemented in the original organism because of the realization that the probability is so disappearingly small to get all that together that yeah. it doesn't warrant yeah. But but there seemed to be a psychology, and here's my main point, this huge sigh of relief. Ha! Huh, we can get away from that. Now have RNA doing it. Which tells you how dissatisfied they were with the protein synthesis theory in exactly. the first place. Exactly. It just hung out all over the place. Even the Nobel Committee, in my view, was driven by that because the time period between publishing senses, uh, such as first paper and getting the Nobel Prize was short enough that he was still in a postdoc when he got it. Yes. It'll come on in just a minute. It's on? Okay. There you go. While I applaud these authors for retracting their article, I would like to suggest that between the time that the article was published and the time of the retraction, there were a number of doctoral students going through programs who said, hooray, here is a Nobel Prize person who teaches at Harvard who has come up with this new fact, and they quote it in their paper, which is then, and they quote other people who are quoting it in peer-reviewed scientific journals. The fact that these people wrote a small retraction is not going to have any effect on the doctoral students who are studying the same area and attempting to quote the big name people because they have the hard copy article that originally came out. 
And I, I see this as a tremendous problem. I don't know what there is in the scientific world for citation indexes, but in the social sciences, there's a social science citation index. You can look up any article by author, by journal, or by the, the, any title forever back and forever forward. Mm -hmm. And you pick and, choo pick and choose which ones you want to quote in your paper. And if eight people who are also famous people quoting in peer-reviewed journals are re quoting this original article and agreeing with it, this thing is never going to die just because they retracted it. I think it's a, a huge problem in higher education and in the scientific and in the social world for, <clears throat> for replicating things that are not true. Well, you will notice that uh, Stanley Miller's experiment is still there. I was appalled at that. Why, why would they quote the Miller-Urey experiment when it's been discredited for the last, what, 25 or 30 years? Why would they still qu keep quoting it? Well, it's in textbooks. We know that it's yeah. still today. So. Well, maybe they had to quote it because if they didn't, people would say, well, haven't you heard of Stanley Miller? Yeah, yeah. You know, but you would think there'd be a little note saying that um, although their, their uh, hypothesized early Earth atmosphere was not accurate yeah. or something like that, but I mean, it almost reads like cheerleading. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's part of what's going on here is that, is that we are not witnessing scientific investigation. We are witnessing um, uh, evangelism. Evangelism, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I know we criticize our evangelists, but I guess it's a common human failing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> When you do a search, uh, does it come up, say, little red, red thing afterwards, this has been retracted? Well, I don't know, but when I went to get the, uh, the article um, um, from the internet, the original article, there was this big blue banner across the top of it saying retracted. And it was on every page. So that they, they do actually try. But it's still on library shelves in hard copy. That's right, and the hard copy does not say retracted. Nobody goes back and goes through all of the nature articles, uh, nature magazines that are in, in libraries and, and stamps something over it. If you, if you don't do this on the internet, you would not necessarily know that it had been retracted. Uh, in, interestingly, not only is there a big red banner that says retracted, but if you read the entire article all the way through, at the bottom, the retraction is done in full. So with the internet, they actually try. But you're right, with the, with the hard copies, uh, who's to know? And people will quote it and not, and not have. It'll be interesting to see whether the citations continue to click up. You know, if, if next year there are 14 citations, I will worry. Because there shouldn't be that many. Or if there are, the citation should be with comments about how uh, this looked like a promising uh, 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 line of research, but it turns out that it wasn't. Uh, we need those kinds of uh, self-critical uh, or self-theory critical uh, views that we don't always get. W wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, peer review at a minimum check references to make sure they're valid? It all depends on whether you buy it or not. You see, if you if you accept the main conclusions, you look it over and you say, yeah, that fits with what I know. Yeah, that fits with what I know. You don't really 
uh, you don't really dig too deeply because that's human nature. On the other hand, if you think that this guy is way off base, then you'll go, and he quoted that paper, and he quoted that paper, and you'll do that. And they may have, the two reviewers may have quoted the same, uh, I mean, the, or the two, uh, the, the two papers that you're looking at may have quoted the exact same paper, but in one case you wouldn't dig that far. Uh, this is a very interesting issue to me because I have sat on lots of doctoral committees and I have peer-reviewed papers. And the one that troubled me the most was when a doctoral student that I sat on the committee of quoted me and misquoted me. And when I called them on it, they said, but I found it on the internet. And here is this person that said that you said. And I said, I'm sorry, they didn't. And the reply to me was basically, oh, lady, you forgot what you did. And so I went back to check everything to try to straighten it out. And you cannot imagine the pushback I got from other people because they wanted to believe the student over me. And the student was quoting my published peer-reviewed paper. So, oh, and, and, and one more response. Um, when you're reading a doctoral dissertation, there may be 20 pages of references at the end. And you go down, at least this to my shame, is what I did. I went down and I looked for important people in the field, people whose work that I knew. Did they quote them? Did they quote them right? Did they get all the right people there? I did not go through every single one of the references of 20 pages of references to see if they got it right. I would never have done anything. I'd still be reading them because there are so many. And the same, similar thing I'm going to guess happens when you read a, and are peer reviewing a journal article. There are so many references. You're going to have to go back and read all those. And, and you're not getting paid for it. No, you're not and you're not getting any credit for it. <laughs> At some point, you have to say, is it worth it? You have to have a certain amount of trust. Somebody que who questions a Harvard Nobel Prize winner in a doctoral committee is gonna be a crackpot. And so, unless you go in with all of the retractions, they're just gonna eat you alive. Oh yeah, go ahead. I had, in a, in a very different area, I had a, an experience that may illustrate the point. Um, had a paper turned down. In a journal, we had published four or five papers in... So they knew you? Yes. New editor. But the reviewer canned my paper because he did not like the results did not even bother going back to the journal he was reviewing for to see that his comments had, were already demonstrated to be wrong. And the, the new editor went and said, yeah, uh, we're, not, we're not going to publish it for this and this reason. With, as I said, the evidence that what we were saying was right already in the literature, but not just in the literature, in that very journal. Did, did you wind up uh, publishing somewhere else then? It's recent enough that I, it's been a great deal of time and effort. I will, but I haven't yet. Oh, okay. I'm at a stage in life where it does make a big difference to me. Um, so I'm wondering if, um, if, if there's certain uh, assumptions here, because I, um, is a protocell a cell, does it have a bilipid membrane? Uh, no. Well, it may have a bilipid membrane. Um, that's what is generally assumed to, d to be the case. I, when I was reading through the paper, I never saw anything that said the enclosed with the bilipid membrane. It just, it just said protocell and assumed that everybody knew what they were talking about. So protocell may be not a cell, but it may be a puddle with chemistry going on. And Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So um, it definitely doesn't have a, a bilipid membrane with an inside and an outside, which is what cells have. Right. That look different from each other. 
Um, so is there sort of an assumption here? I mean, is, is the idea of um, a free-floating RNA that replicates itself, it seems as though there's an assumption here that that's not, that's not what he's talking about. He's, he's trying to figure out how to get replication, chemical replication, but not enzymatic self-replication. So is there, has, has the scientific community moved on beyond the idea of maybe there was some, you know, five-base nucleotide that does have the property of self-replication and that's how it gets started? I think the scientific community has accepted that no self, uh, no five-base polynucleotide is going to have any ability to self-replicate uh, by its own contortions. The smallest that I've seen in the literature is supposedly 180 base that can join two relatively long pieces together to make a third piece. To, uh, is that it, join it together? Does it make itself? Uh, well, to make uh, I don't know if they've even gotten to the point where it makes itself. I think it just joins two shorter pieces. Uh, you know, this whole thing about, well, it gets a little longer, and then it gets a little longer, and then it gets a little longer, and, uh, um, <coughs> and pretty soon you have 180 bases. Um, that whole scenario is kind of, uh, you know, if you squint real hard and you look at it kind of cockeyed, why well, maybe you think it could. It is certainly not the kind of thing that you would say it's demonstrable. I mean, you heard Sostak, who's being as uh, honest as he can about uh, where the situation is yet. He keeps saying, no, it, it hasn't happened yet. So, so hence the, the, the need to find a, a chemical way to reproduce RNA because the the enzymatic ability of RNA is, is just figured just not, you know, statistically it just cannot be done. Well, yeah, and see one of the problems is, okay, so it finally does reproduce itself. Well, first of all, you actually have to have two copies in order to do that. You have to have the original RNA that, that forms into the enzyme, and then you have to have another copy that can be copied that does the enzyme as well. So you're not talking about 180 bases in a row. Now you're talking about 360 bases in a row with I don't know how, how much slop in the uh, base configuration there is. Um, I, no, I, I don't think there's anybody else. Uh, but now you're talking about you know, getting 360 bases without any enzymatic stuff at all. And then finally, what we're finding out now is that so you copied the RNA, now it won't come apart so that you can do another copy. So one copy is all you get. Well, maybe if you boil it in water and then you send it through ice, uh, you can get it cool enough fast enough, but it has to get from the, water, from the boiling water to the ice in less than about one second. Well, that doesn't sound like a plausible uh, way of doing things. If you think about it, what it means is that instead of having a whole earth where you could have, you know, every uh, cubic centimeter of this doing something every one second, uh, there's only a few little places like Iceland, maybe, where you can have the requisite heat with volcanoes to uh, disanneal this and then the uh, and then the cooling instantly as it runs through the glacier, I guess. You know, it's, the more you look at it, the more it looks like Rube Goldberg, and I'm sorry, but Rube Goldberg was designed. <laughs> well, you can solve this whole copying thing, maybe. I, I mean, I shouldn't say maybe. 
even if you did solve that, you still got this huge quantum hurdle of how there's even a language, you know, and, and a code. So it's like, it's come actually, on. it's actually worse than that. Not only do you have to get the 360, you know, 180 plus 180 that are close enough that it will work, but then you have to assume that all of the language that evolves out of that will also be useful in the new DNA protein stuff that you're doing. It's as if you write these wonderful instructions in English and then you find out that really what you need is Swahili. It's highly unlikely that you can take RNA and transfer it straight across. Well, with the possible exception of ribosomes. But, you know, most of the stuff, you need, you need the right language. Well, you, you don't get a language out of just replication. So. Well, these people think that you can. Yeah. It takes faith, brother. Yeah. <laughs> the more the better. Back over here. As I, as I listen, I'm reminded, as I said, I haven't looked in the literature recently, but reminded of a paper that I believe was a graduate student project in SOSTEC's lab, where they were trying to mimic the original RNA world by running a thermal cycler in such a way they could create random, in other words, non-predetermined uh, uh, nucleotide sequences. And then they're taking it back to testing for catalytic activity. And then saying this is a reasonable model for what could have happened in the RNA world. But uh, they were producing with the cycler the conditions hundreds if not thousands of different variants in very short periods of time. To use that as a model of the prebiotic world just amazes me. Well, you know. First the water dumped into the heated pool and then it got splashed back onto the ice and then it got washed back into the heated pool and splashed back onto the ice and... You, you make it sound very probable. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, what, what, what totally amazes me is that we have theologians in Christendom and in our own church who look at this stuff and throw up their hands and say, we've got to fit evolution into our, our system. And not only that, in some cases in the, I mean, intelligent design at least will have a God in the picture. In some cases we have people who say, and the God can't really interfere in nature once it gets started. And I'm just, it, the bowing to what is basically chutzpah just blows me away. I mean, you can't question these guys and say maybe they don't have it all together. They know they don't have it all together. You know, he was solving a major problem. It turns out it's not solved yet. We don't have an answer for that. But there must be one somewhere. Again, we were blinded by our faith. Totally blinded by our faith. Why can't we just accept that maybe there's some things that science not only doesn't know, but maybe never will? It's still there, it's just a roadblock. That's right, that's right. We found out that the path through the roadblock wasn't really there, and the roadblock is right back where it started from. I think we'll, one more comment oh, and we'll. So, uh, we always hear about the peer-reviewed stuff. So who reviews the peers? 
Well, that's the thing. And yeah. you see, if the peers think, oh, well, hey, Sostak, Harvard, Nobel Prize, who are we to ask? You know, uh, then, then the paper flies right on. You know, you mentioned within the church in the 70s, early 80s, Brinsmead was a big name. Yeah? Yes. You know, and he would change his position, go this way, go that way. And folk who followed him, well, he changes his position, the folk have no one else, so they drop off. Uh, so many young people lost, and today I am told that he's a Baptist pastor. Um, Brinsmead is? That's what I'm told in Australia. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have a proof, but the thing is, the, the, the truth the, though, that he changed his positions again and again. That is true. Uh, totally left Ellen White, totally. Yeah. Uh, my uh, understanding is that there was a period of time when he totally left the Bible too, and that he'd gone quasi-atheist. Um, I'm encouraged right. to see that he's at least back as a Baptist. That's, uh, That's what I was told. Like, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the truth, though, that he changed his position so many times. You know, uh, within Adventism today, emerging church, yeah. right? Um, spiritual formation, a young pastor from one of the cemeteries, I mean seminaries, uh, came to um, our church in Ohio, and he started this spiritual formation thing. And uh, then my kids growing up, and he says, it's uh, all you need is love. You don't need the Ten Commandments. He's preaching from the front. And I have my. I, I'm encouraged to know that our pastors don't feel that you don't need the Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, at the end of the day, it's okay to sit with your wife and sip on a glass of wine. <laughs> you know, where have we come? Where are we going? Yes, coming out of the seminary, Adventist seminary. Oh no, oh no, I was foolish enough to be the head elder and the 600 member, I mean, the huge church. The senior pastor says, let's go to um, Willow Creek, you know. There was a time when people used to come to us how we were so successful. Today we have to go somewhere else. Really? Well, you, you know, the interesting thing of it is, in terms of nutrition, they're still coming to us. Yes. And uh, yes. that, ought to, that ought to give us at least a little bit of encouragement. Uh, but we have part of our church that is uh, you know, trying to smooth over all those differences right. because we're, we really don't have a leg to stand on, which is, of course, bunk right. uh, in terms of nutrition. You know, uh, you wonder about what those people, what they do with blue zones. Doesn't it mean something? But it's, uh, anyway. Uh, well, point, so be sure you come to the Vegetarian Conference, sign up for it, end of February here. It's every five years. International Vegetarian Conference. Congress. Uh, and, it's, and it's here at Loma Linda. Yeah. Does it happen anywhere else? No. So apparently, International guys still has from all over coming and speaking on yeah. our research. Okay. Uh, right anyway, before APC. next week, as I said before, we're going to talk about a, a paper that got into the peer-reviewed literature, don't ask me how, um, that criticizes Ronald Fisher's proof of evolution. Yeah. In case you're wondering, it's partly authored by John Sanford. So may have, many of you may know is a geneticist, world-class geneticist, and a short-age creationist. We will see what happens.